Hey, well, as you are having a seat, uh, I hope you have a Bible. If you do, open up to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9 is where you'll want to turn. We are in week 7 of this journey through the biblical book of, of 1 Corinthians. Uh, and 1 Corinthians, we are calling this series, We've Got Issues. How many people have issues this morning? Yes, we have issues. And like we keep saying, if you don't recognize that you have one, then you just, then your issue's denial. Um, but the reality is, is that we know that we have issues. And this book was written to people 2,000 years years ago, 2,000 years ago, but they were people just like you and me. They were people who, who were trying to, who wanted to, who had the desire to follow Jesus, but they were living in a world, in a time and a place where culturally people had no real interest in following Jesus. The culture was moving against them, and they were finding themselves asking all kinds of questions as to, well, God, how, in a world that it seems like it's going totally the opposite direction, how do we live out this faith in Jesus Christ? And last week, last week we we talked, I mean, chapters 8, 9, and 10 are really one big conversation that, that Paul is having, again, about how do we live out the Christian life in a hostile world. And how do, we, how do we deal with our rights as believers and the fact that God has given us so much and he's blessed us with so much and we have all these great freedoms in Christ, but how do we balance that with the realities that we live in the world that doesn't recognize that and we have lost people everywhere that need to come to salvation in Jesus? And so last week we talked about making sure that we don't exercise our rights, even our freedoms, which it's hard for us to do as Americans because it's all about our rights, but how we don't use our rights in ways that become a stumbling block for other people and that would hinder them from coming to Jesus Christ or would cause a fellow brother or sister in Christ to stumble in any way. Last week, the, the real question was this, do you love people enough to willingly Okay, and that's a big point, to willingly give up your rights to be sure that they don't get in the way of people coming to Jesus. This week, I just give you the big question up front, is this, what are you actually willing to do in order to see people come to salvation in Jesus Christ? What are you willing to do? And Paul, he, he jumps right into chapter 9 with a personal illustration about rights. So join me there in, in uh, chapter 9. We'll start in verse 1, and he says this. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Now, now one of the things you need to understand is he's laying out this evidence that he is an apostle. Because there were some people that said, hey, wait a minute, didn't you come along later? Weren't you the guy that was killing Christians and what happened and are you sure you're an apostle? And, and he's laying out this evidence. It's kind of like his resume that he's an apostle. And he's saying, I, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And some of you are thinking like, huh, yeah, he wasn't one of those guys following Jesus around. But you might remember that in the book of Acts when he was on his way to Damascus to go and arrest and even kill Christians, that, that God met him there. And that he saw Jesus and Jesus Jesus basically blinded him, he says, and, and he says, Paul, at the time it was Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he had this encounter with Jesus that changed everything. And, and so he says, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And that was one of the requirements to be an apostle. You had to see the risen Lord. And he says, are you not the result of my work in the Lord? In other words, didn't I come and teach you about Jesus? Didn't I come and teach you about the resurrection? He says, even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Again, he's laying out this evidence. He says, this is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. He says, don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us as the other apostles um, and the Lord's brothers and Cephas, okay, Cephas, remember, that's Peter. And, and he's saying, hey, these guys get to do all these things. Shouldn't I be able to? He says, or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right to not work 
for a living. Now, what he's doing in, in, in this situation here is he's setting up this case and this argument that he has a right, that he has the right to, to be paid for his work in ministry. And, and, and Paul uses these six rhetorical questions to, first of all, prove that he's an apostle, and then to say, hey, don't I have the right to you know, to have some, my needs taken care of so I can give myself to full-time ministry. And, and he says, I have that right. He says, the other apostles, they have that right. And some of them even take along their, their wives. That's how we know that several of the apostles were married. And we know that Peter had a wife. If you go back and read the, the gospel stories, we know that, that he, we know he had a wife because he had a mother-in-law, okay, that got sick one time and Jesus healed, healed her. And so, um, uh, he's setting out these questions, and they're all rhetorical, and he's saying, hey, look, I have the right to do this. I have the right to have you take care of me. He further defends this case, starting down in verse 11, where he says, if we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? Now catch this part, he says, but we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights. And I am not writing this in hope that you will do such, a, such things for me, for I would rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me, he says, if I don't preach the gospel, if I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me, then that is my reward. Just this that in preaching the gospel I may offer it free of charge and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Now, six times here he, he uses the word rights and he's saying, hey, I have certain rights that I could say, hey, I deserve this and you guys ought to pay up. Okay? But then he comments three times, he, he tells us, but I'm not going to use my rights. I'm not going to tell you that you've got to do this. I, I'm not even going to take anything. And he says, and the reason for that is I don't want anything to be a problem for people coming to the gospel. Several years back, I remember when I was in Bible college, and I was watching TV, and it was back in the day where they, uh, there was a bunch of these televangelist people, and they were constantly asking for money, Right? And I remember there was uh, certain ones that had these crazy downfalls. Some of them were, you know, because of immorality. Some of them were because of, you know, taking funds and things. And I, and I remember thinking to myself, as I'm preparing to be a pastor, like, man, these guys are really giving pastors a bad name. And, and, and in the same way, back in this day, there were priests that worked in all of these little temples to all of these Greek gods, and those people would get money. And some of them, remember last week we were talking about the food sacrifice to idols? Some of them were using the sacrifices and things to take advantage of people to line their own pockets, and people knew that. And so when Paul comes on the scene, he says, I'm going to distance myself from all that that's going on so that you don't think that I'm just some other guy coming into town that's trying to push this religious practice and line my pockets with your money. And so he says, look, even though I have this right, I'm not going to push my rights so th to make sure that people can come to Jesus without any kind of, like, you know, having him suspect about what he's doing. And, and, and so then he says, look, I'm not demanding my rights. And, and he says, my purpose isn't for financial gain. He says, my purpose really is the fact that God has compelled me to preach the gospel. I mean, the fact that he saw the risen Jesus on the, the road to Damascus that changed his life. And he says, I am compelled. And then he says, woe to me if I don't preach. He says, God told me to preach. And man, I'm in big trouble if I don't. And so he says, my purpose, my purpose is much bigger than my rights. 
Now, I have these rights, but I'm giving them up so that I can preach. And so he uses his own personal example to say, hey, just because we have rights doesn't mean we need to push our rights, especially in order to make sure that people can come to the gospel. And his purpose is much greater. And we've seen throughout the book of 1 Corinthians a few times already that as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to put our rights, our privileges, our liberties, and our freedom sometimes aside for the purposes of the kingdom of God above our own personal interests so that we can advance God's work. And next, Paul goes on to explain what our purpose really is. And he starts in verse 19 where he says this, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone. To win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. To win the Jews. To the, those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. So this is a really, really powerful verse. Six times Paul tells us what his purpose is. He says, my purpose, five times he says, my purpose is to, he uses the word win, to win some. And this word win in the Greek, kerdiano, okay, it means to have a profit. And I think it's interesting, some of the scholars as I was studying this, they said, you know, before Paul was saying, hey, I don't want any financial gain from this. He says, I'm, I'm giving away that right so I can, I can preach the gospel. So here he finds a word, a unique word in the Greek language to say, this is really my profit. My profit is bringing people to Jesus. And when people come to the Lord, that's, that, that, that's better than anything else I could ever get paid. I mean, when I see these people coming to Christ, man, that is really a win for me. And, and, and that should be a win for all of us. And then the final time, the final time he says, I have become all things, okay, to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. Okay, so he's become how many things? All things. Okay, to which, how many people? To all people. Why? So that, so that by all possible means he might what? Yes, yeah, save some. See, his purpose was to save people. And, and some people might have the question, well, what, what's he saving them from. And some of us, you know, we, we might come up with the answer, but what the Bible tells us is this. In Romans 5, 9, it says, since we have now been justified by his blood, the blood of Jesus, that is, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? You know, some of us just say, well, we're saved to eternal life. We're saved in this life so that we have eternal life after us. But, you know, how often do we really think about the fact that we're saved from God's wrath? You know, we don't like to think about that very much. We don't like to think about the reality that, that without Jesus, without this hope of eternal life, that, that we experience God's wrath. And folks, let me ask you a question this morning. How seriously do you take the lostness of people around you? I mean, think about that for just a minute. I mean, how seriously do you take the fact that people without Jesus around you are utterly lost. The, the, the Bible says that without Jesus' sacrifice, without their belief in Jesus, putting their trust in him, it says that we would receive God's wrath. I mean, we love to think of God as this loving God. And there's some people that, think, that, that don't want to believe in God because they said, well, how, how could God be wrathful? Well, well, the reason that he could be wrathful is because he's totally just, as well as totally loving. And, and so, those who don't have Christ will experience God's ultimate wrath. And how often do you actually stop and recognize that? And, and so, as I was reading this this week, 
I was keenly aware as I was walking around, I was thinking, you know, I'm looking around, and again, I, I don't know a lot of the people. I was even driving down the freeway, and I'm wondering about the people in the cars driving by me, and I'm kind of looking at people going, I wonder if they know Jesus. If not, you know, then they're going to experience his wrath. And there are a few of them on the freeway that I was kind of hoping that might be the case. But the reality of this is that how, how seriously do I really get the point that my friends and my neighbors, my coworkers, the people I go to school with, the people that I bump into at the grocery store, that the people even in my family and the people who don't know Jesus, that without Jesus they will experience the wrath of God. And when I think about the people in my own family that, that don't know Jesus yet, it, it, it just breaks my heart to, to imagine that they will spend a Christless eternity. And I think this morning we need a wake-up call to the reality that we are surrounded every single day by thousands of people who, who seem nice on the outside, but who are heading for a Christless eternity and towards experiencing God's full wrath because of the sinfulness in their life that Jesus hasn't taken care of because they haven't accepted him. Part of the problem, to be quite honest, especially living in this area, is that they don't look all that lost. They kind of look like a lot of them, like they've got a plan. They, they look pretty good. I mean, they have nice places to live. They drive nice cars. They, they look pretty good, most of them. You know, There's a few of them that look like they've already experienced some wrath. But the reality is, is most people around look pretty good. You guys all look pretty good this morning. And the reality is because they look pretty good, oftentimes we just kind of get lulled into this complacency that says, you know what, well, they look okay. They seem pretty happy. But church, here, here's the thing. They might look happy, but they're lost. They're lost and heading towards destruction. They're, they're like people on a train and the bridge is out up ahead. And the question is, what will you do? What would you sacrifice in order to save them? And Paul is saying, he, he will do anything. He will do all things possible to try to save some. And then he uses this illustration that they can all kind of relate to. Um, on how focused he is, on how honed in he is on this purpose of saving people. This is a passage maybe you've heard before in, in chapter 9, starting in verse 24. He says this, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? It's interesting, as I was studying this, I mean, I, we had the Olympics, you know, this last summer. Uh, how many of you had Olympic fever? Got to watch a lot of that? That was awesome. I just love watching those athletes. And, you know, it's cool because at the end there's a ceremony and they get their medals, you know, and then they play the national anthem for the one that got the gold medal. But there's other people that get the silver and the bronze, right? Back in this day, the, the Olympic Games actually were only 50 miles away from Corinth in the city of Athens, Greece. And then on the other, okay, because it happened every four years, every two years, I mean, every, every like, couple years after, they had similar games. It was like the practice games, actually in Corinth, and they were called the Ithmian games. And, and the same thing happened, you know. But in, in their games, there wasn't a bronze and silver medal. Okay? There was only one person who got the prize. The guy who came across the finish line got first. Everybody else got nada. Okay? I mean, and the reality is, is everybody actually kind of knows that, you know, the silver medal is just the first loser anyways, right? Nobody, nobody runs for the silver medal, okay? There's, nobody goes, yeah, my goal is just, you know, bronze. <laughs> they don't do that, okay? They get out there on the track with the belief that if I do my best, I, I could get the gold. And, and, and in this case, it was true. Only one gets the prize. 
And he says, run in such a way that you get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. What he's basically saying here is this. I am totally disciplined, I am totally honed, I am totally focused in, like those commercials you see and like the little things during the Olympics that show you like how much these Olympians practice, how much they work out, how disciplined they are. And Paul's saying, I'm like that, but for reaching people for the gospel. And I am focused, I am honed in on bringing people to Jesus. I mean, how about us? I mean, are, are we focused? Are we prepared? Are we willing to do anything to save people? The stated purpose of Newberry Park First Christian Church is to develop fully devoted followers of Christ who seek and save the lost. And the reality is, I, I think, if we're not participating and seeking and saving the lost, which is why Jesus said he came, if we're not doing that, then we aren't fully devoted followers of Jesus. We might be good church attenders. We, we might be, you know, and, and again, we, we may be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, but if we're going to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus, we better get after the things that Jesus was after, and that's seeking and saving lost people. And I believe we need a renewed sense of urgency about that purpose of seeking and saving the lost. See, we often approach faith, I think, through this grid of enjoying our rights. In other words, we, we think when we walk in the doors that we have certain rights. And every once in a while, I'm kind of reminded of that because if we do something crazy like move the chairs... People get bent out of shape because they had a right to that chair right where it was sitting, okay? And we think that, that, when, that we have lots of choices. You know, we, we get to choose all these things. And we, get, we want it so it's good for us and comfortable for us so that we like it and we like the songs and we like the atmosphere. Guys, do you have any concept how amazingly blessed we are just to have chairs, I am telling you, there's something deep within me, because I have this honorary side, and some of you know that, <laughs> that one day, I'm telling you, I want to take them all out, and I want to put bricks with little boards on them, because I've preached in eight to ten churches like that. No air conditioners, no really good sound system. No stuff on the, on the walls. Actually, no walls. Just a roof. And when the wind blows, you're thankful that there's no walls. But folks, do you know how blessed we are? And the problem is, is that we've taken these things and we've said, this is what I like about church. If that's what you like about church, then you've got to begin to question, are you a fully devoted follower of Jesus? Or do you just like church? Because the thing that you ought to like the most about this place is coming into the presence of Jesus and his people that help us as we uniquely come together as a body of Christ to encounter him together in a way that empowers us to do his work as we leave this place. Is that your greatest love of coming to church? And Paul is saying, look, we've got we've to refocus and reorient around this purpose. The purpose that God has, has put us here for. And should we, you know, we hope that we create an atmosphere that, that we can enjoy. But more importantly, we pray that we create an atmosphere where every week we get together that you encounter the living God. Because when you encounter him like Paul did on the road to Damascus, 
it will change your life forever. So Paul reminds us how we should regard our rights, and then he reminds us what our real purpose is. But then in chapter 10, okay, chapter 10, he gives us this warning, okay? This is our warning. In, in verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 1, he says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. Now, I, I want to pause it for a minute. In the original language, I love that this passage is awesome, because it, it doesn't have all this kind of flowery language. He, he basically, in the original language, he says, hey, don't be ignorant. Sounds like something my dad would have said. Hey, you, don't be ignorant. And, and, and really, he's saying, and don't be arrogant, and don't get complacent. He says, don't be ignorant and begin to believe that since other people around you are so messed up that by comparison, you're okay. Don't be ignorant and think that, hey, just because you're better than some of them, that you're okay, and that somehow because you're good enough, you're going to be okay, and you're going to be safe from God's wrath. Don't be ignorant and start to think that because you attend church regularly, because maybe you got into a life group, because maybe you've got somewhere where you serve, that somehow you're immune to putting other things before God and struggling in your faith. And then Paul takes it a step further, and and he gives us this warning by giving us an example of what happened in the Old Testament to the children of Israel when God saved them from slavery in Egypt. And if you're new to studying the Bible, God's people, the children of Israel, back in the Old Testament, they, they were put in, they were taken into captivity by the Egyptians, they were enslaved, and after 430 years, God said, okay, I'm gonna, re, I'm gonna take my people out of slavery, and, and you might remember, you know, if you, if you saw the Prince of Egypt movie, the Disney movie, that God had, you know, there were all the plagues, the ten plagues, where God made a mockery of all of the gods of Egypt, and the last one was the death of the firstborn. And then after that, it says that the Egyptians drove them out. Okay? Get out of here because your God is, is messing with us. And, and, and they head out. And then, you know, they head out into the desert. And you might remember that after they started to head out into the desert, that the um, Pharaoh and all of his leaders were like, oh, my gosh, what have we done? It's like, we're going to have to make bricks now. Somebody better go get those guys. So they took off after the, after the children of Israel, and they're chasing them down in the desert. And the, and the children of Israel, are, you know, they're walking, and the Egyptians are on horses and chariots and everything. And you can go read it's an awesome story. And they, they, but then all of a sudden, the children of Israel come to the Red Sea, and there's a Red Sea in front of them, and Pharaoh's army behind them, and they're like, oh, what are we going to do? You know? So Moses, okay, goes, God, yeah, what are we going to do, God? And so you know the story. He says, hey, Lift up your staff, and the Red Sea parted, and the people walked right through. Okay? That's where we pick the story up that Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10. Okay? In verse 2, it says, They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Okay? They went through the waters. Okay? There was this cloud that led them, and they walked through the waters. And then verse 3, it says, And they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. He's making this allusion to the fact that there was this point in Exodus chapter 17 where they, they had no water, and the people started to, you know, they're in the desert, and so they've got no water, and so, you know, they didn't have camelbacks and all that stuff back then, so, you know, they couldn't carry it around so much. So they said, Moses, why have you brought us out here? We're going to die in the desert. We're going to die of thirst. What do we do? And Moses, again, he turns to God and he goes, yeah, God, what are we going to do? And he says, take your staff and walk over there and smack the rock. And he smacks the rock and water. Now, here's the thing you've got to understand. Not just a little water. It was enough water to give water to over a million people and all their livestock. Okay, so this rock turns into this amazing gusher of water. Okay, so this is this miraculous way that God saves them. And and then he goes on in verse 5, he says, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now check this out. These are the people that God saved out of Egypt. 
He says, I, I, I want to be your God, so I'm going to save you out of Egypt. I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments and all this good stuff. I'm going to give you water when you need it. He, they, he gave him food when they needed it. He, you know, this manna stuff that came down every night so that they would have something to eat. And, and, and the people would complain, oh, you know, we're tired of the manna. We need something else. And so God sent quail, okay, lots of quail for them to eat. And so God was taking care of the people. <laughs> Excuse me. But then it says, you know, but their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, verse 6, he says, now these things occurred as examples to keep us, okay, that's us, okay, from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry, okay, we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Then he says, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as a warning for us on whom the culmination of all the ages has come. Okay, so basically, I'll try to describe this real quick. As you read through Old Testament history, there's some shocking things that happen. Okay, they went through the Red Sea. That one's always blown my mind. Could you imagine walking through the Red Sea? There's two walls of water on the side, and it's like, I, I, I would, I'm not sure I would have made it through, because I would have been the kid that stopped and went, oh, look at the fish. <laughs> like, whoa, check this out. You know, I would have been like so enthralled with this whole thing. Right? I'm sure my parents would have had to drag me through. I mean, they walked through the sea. And then they, they watched a rock have enough water so that all of them could drink and all their animals could drink and everything else. When they got hungry, every morning they got up and there was bread on the ground for them. God's doing all this stuff for them. And yet a couple chapters later, they make a golden calf. And they start to worship it. Now does that whole don't be ignorant statement make a little sense? Like, guys, don't be ignorant like these guys. I mean, God was doing everything for them, and then what happened? Oh, let's make a golden calf and worship that thing. And then it says a little after that, they went and there was, they were by the land of the Moabites, so all the men were like, Hey, we've been marching through the desert with all these women for, you know, a couple years now, and they're looking kind of dirty. Look at them Moabite women. And it says they started going over and, and, and having sexual relations with these Moabite women that God already told them not to, and then those women got them to serve their other gods. And so what God do? God wipes them out. 23,000 in one day. Boom, gone. One day... They turn on God in the middle of the desert. Moses is going, you know, Moses, poor Moses, he's out there in the front with the, you know, with the staff. And, and the people are like, Moses, dude, you don't even know where we're going. We're stuck in the desert. We're all going to die. And what happens? God says, I, man, I'm just tired of the whining. And so he sends all these snakes. And the snakes come and they bite the people and many of the people die. I, and God is saying, look, these people who were the ones that I chose, who were the ones that I had saved, the ones that I was providing for every single day. Later on, we find out after all those years, their, their sandals never even wore out. Okay? I mean, mine last a couple years, but come on, 40 years of walking in the desert? Their sandals didn't wear out. They had food every day. They had water when they needed it. They had everything. And God is saying, look, he's providing everything. But the reality is, is let's get honest, folks. The warning to us is this today. You have it really good. In fact, you have it so good and God is taking such good care of you that there are times in your life and times in your week that you start to focus on how good you've made it for yourself instead of how good God has been to you. Come on, let's get honest. We live in a country where we have so much and we're looking around and so we start worshiping all this other stuff. We start worshiping the homes we live in, the cars that we drive. We start worshiping, you know, sports figures. 
I cried last night. <laughs> we have these forms of worship in our lives, folks. And God is saying, look, don't be ignorant. Do not be arrogant. Do not be complacent with all that God has done for you. Because if you do, and you start worshiping other gods, then folks, you have lost your purpose. You have lost your way in the desert just like these folks. And even though our desert might look a whole lot nicer than theirs did, we still will find ourselves lost. But if we will focus upon our purpose, if we will focus on the real thing that God wants us to do as his people, which is to seek and to save the lost in the world, then you will constantly have to look to God for guidance. If you're constantly about sharing the good news of Jesus with other people, you're constantly rec going to recount the story. Look at what God's done for me. Look at how God has saved me, and I want you to have it too. And when they start asking questions, where are you going to go for the answers? Well, you're going to go to the place that all of us should go for the answers, and it's going to drive you back to this. Because your nice home and your nice car and the sports fish and everybody else, they ain't bringing people to Jesus. But if you focus on who gave you the blessing to have all that stuff in the first place, if you focus on, okay, not our rights, but our purpose, then you're going to have to keep your eyes on Jesus. And when you keep your eyes on Jesus, it changes everything. It changes the game. And it will remind you day in and day out that your purpose is to worship him and to bring other people to Jesus. Even poor Moses this great figure of faith lost his way. Later on, towards the end, the poor guy, towards the end of this journey in the desert, the people started getting crazy again because they needed water. And, and Moses turned to God, and this is in Numbers chapter, uh, chapter 20. You can go home and read the story later. It's a, it's a great story. Get some more of the detail, but basically how, how it goes is this is uh, Moses goes, turns to God and he says, hey, what should I do? <laughs> you know, and he says, well, there's a rock over there, okay? And for some of us, we're like, oh yeah, we've been there before. But this time, God says, in the presence of all the elders of Israel, he says, take the staff with you, and he says, but go over there and talk to the rock, okay? And I'm like, that sounds a little weird, Okay? But then the people distract Moses by like, Moses, we're all going to die. And Moses gets frustrated. And in his frustration, Moses doesn't follow God's command. Instead of going over and talking to the rock like he was told to, Moses reverts back to what he did before. And he goes over and he strikes the rock with the, with the stick. Now, the interesting thing is the water still came out, and the people were saved, because God was going to save them anyways. But in that moment, the Lord looks to Moses, and he says, Moses, why didn't you obey? And Moses is going, well, I got the right result. I, I got the right stuff. I got the people to shut up. And God's going, I don't care about all that. I care about your obedience. And he says, and because you were not obedient, I mean, doesn't that seem like a simple thing? He hit the rock instead of talked. He says, because you weren't obedient to me, you don't get to go into the promised land. They're like, what? After all that? Yeah, you know what happened? I hate to say this, but Moses got ignorant. And he reverted back to what he'd always done. 
And the temptation for many of us is to just keep doing what we've always done. But I read something just a while back that I, I just thought was so good, and it, it's basically this, that, that yesterday's answers won't work for today's questions. You see, sometimes we're going to have to do things differently in order to do the work of God. But what we're going to have to do is daily go to him and ask him, God, how do we do this? Lord, how do we take care of the people? How do we help keep the people from dying? And day in and day out, God's, you know what? And one time he may say, hit that thing with a stick, and one day he may say, go talk to it. But we've got to pay attention and not get ignorant and not get arrogant and not get stuck or complacent, but every day seek out the purposes of God and do what he says, not what we think we ought to do. And in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, verse 12, he says this, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Be careful. Remember what your purpose is and be careful, folks. He goes on to say this famous verse in verse 13, 14. He says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. Notice who provides the way out. Who provides the way out? Yeah. But how often does Ken try to say, oh, I got this. I can figure my way out. I got. In fact, you know what? I've been here before. I've been here. I made this mistake before. And guess what? This is what I did last time, and this is what I know how to do to get out. Isn't that what Moses did? And he kind of got in trouble. Why? Because he didn't seek God today. He just, he just recalled what happened before. Folks, we have to be recalling every single day what our purpose is. And the conclusion is this. That Paul finally goes on in, in 1 Corinthians 10, and he says this in verse 23 and 24. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. He says, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many so that they might be what? Folks, God gives us a clear purpose. And if we will focus on his purpose, we won't get lost. But if we focus on our rights, if we focus on what we get out of everything, I guarantee you, there's a desert to be wandered in. And every day we've got to remind ourselves that we have this great purpose. And quite simply, folks, our purpose is to seek and save the lost. Saved people, save people. What price tag would you put on somebody's salvation? What would you be willing to do in order to ensure that your children, that your unsaved family members, your friends, your neighbors, all come to faith in Jesus? Has the comfort of your own faith lulled you into a complacency or even apathy about the eternal destiny of the people around you? Or are you willing to bring to bear every possible resource that you have to help bring people to Christ? Each week we are reminded when we take communion how far God would go to save us. But, but not just to save you, but to save the world. Every week as we take the piece of bread that represents Jesus' broken body and the cup that represents his blood, every week we're reminded that God will go to the ultimate lengths to save us and to save everyone around us. And all of those people around us that are lost, they simply need one thing. They simply need to turn to Jesus as Lord. And this morning... If you have not done that, if you have not made Jesus Lord of your life, then I would love to talk to you about what that means and how you do that and to help you
get on track with him. And for the rest of you this morning that have already experienced salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, then I would ask you this this morning as you take communion. That not only this morning do you take those emblems and you realize what Christ has done for you, but this morning that you take those emblems and you realize what Christ has done for everyone. And I would encourage you this morning to think of people in your life People in your family, people in your neighborhood, people at work that don't yet know Jesus. And before you take the emblems this morning, would you stop for a moment and and ask God to help you realize that part of your purpose is helping them realize that Jesus did this for them too? And just spend some time and pray. Pray for them. Pray that we as a church, that we as individuals will recognize our purpose and live it out every single day so that we might win some. Because that's why Jesus died. Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you, we thank you, and we praise you for the indescribable gift of Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. And Father, we come to you acknowledging, Lord God, that that you have paid it all for us. And Father, we pray that we likewise would do all that we can in all possible ways to help people come to Jesus. Lord God, we thank you and praise you. It is in Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen.